we are continuing our study of the Pentateuch, the name we give to the first five books of the Bible. The first of those is the book of Genesis. It begins with the record of creation and ends with the death of Joseph in Egypt. The remaining four books in the Pentateuch, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, all focus on the story of getting the children of Israel out of slavery in Egypt to the promised land of Canaan, a journey that took a while, 40 years they spent wandering around in the wilderness. The book of Exodus, Exodus was the first chapter in the story of getting them from Egypt to Canaan. It's the story of God giving them, getting them out of Egypt and down to Mount Sinai where they spent 11 months and meeting with God. And during those 11 months, God gave them the law. He gave, made a covenant with them called the Mosaic Covenant. They foolishly worshipped the golden calf. And he gave them instructions on how to build the tabernacle, and they built it. We went through that last week. This morning, we're starting the book of Leviticus. The book of Leviticus is a book that's called the Book of Worship. It's named after the tribe of Levi. And the reason it's named after Levi is because it's a book that tells the Levites how to uh, operate the tabernacle. Uh, just toward the end of their 11 months in Mount Sinai, God gave instructions about the tabernacle. They built the tabernacle. And the next question is, what do we do with it? Not That's a very logical question. For all of us who are outside of Washington, that's a logical question. And so the book of Leviticus kicks in at this point, and Leviticus tells the children of Israel how to worship in the tabernacle and later on the temple. The, it's named uh, Leviticus because it's named after the, uh, the tribe of Levi is pointed out, and the Levites are responsible for handling worship in Israel. The Levites, as a tribe, were responsible for taking care of the tabernacle. When it came time to move from one location to another, the, tab the Levites would assemble, break it down, and then set it up in the new location. And then when God moved, they would break it down, set it up in a new location. So the Levites were responsible for maintaining the tabernacle. And years later, when Solomon built the temple, was just a permanent form of tabernacle. Uh, they were responsible for caring for the temple. Now, among the Levites, there was one family called the family of Aaron, Moses' brother. And it was from his family that the priests came. To be a priest, you had to be a descendant of Aaron. Aaron was part of the tribe of Levi. The tribe of Levi, again, took care of the tabernacle, but that one family in the tribe of Levi supplied the priests. And, and the book of Leviticus is primarily focused on them. It's a manual for the Levites, and in particular the family of Aaron, in particular the priests. It showed them gave them instructions on how they were supposed to uh, worship in the temple. Now, we're going to examine a number of subjects as we work our way through Leviticus. We won't spend a whole lot of time on Leviticus, but I want to hit the major points, which are the animals that were sacrificed. There were a handful of animals that were sacrificed on a regular basis at the temple. And then there were several, there were five types of sacrifices. There were some special sacrifices for special uh, occasions, but on a regular routine basis, there are five types of sacrifices, and we're going to look at those this, this evening. So you had the animals that were sacrificed, the types of sacrifices, and then there were the seven annual feasts, which are a great picture of Israel's history, a great picture of some lessons God wanted Israel to learn, and the seven annual feasts were also a prophetic calendar, giving Israel, in a sense, a prophetic picture of their future all the way to the returning of the Lord and the setting up of the Millennial Kingdom, a fascinating study which we will, Lord willing, spend time on next week. Hopefully this evening we'll work at the animals and the sacrifices. Now, first, a brief history of sacrifices because we need to learn to distinguish the sacrifices that the Israelites offered from those that most of the world offers. If you travel around the world, visit any country you like, at any time in history you'll find that the religious folk there were offering sacrifices. They might offer them in different ways and different animals, sometimes people, sometimes animals, whatever the case was. But sacrificing, offering sacrifices is common to men throughout history, from the very beginning uh, all the way up until the Lord returns at the end of the tribulation. 
And this has presented a problem for Christianity because God ordained the Judeo-Christian religion. God ordained that the foundation of this religion is the sacrificial death of Christ. And when all other religions offer sacrifices, the Judeo-Christian religion looks less divine. Let me explain what I'm getting at. The very foundation of the Judeo-Christian religion is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross. Now, I'm not trying to suggest that there aren't other things in the Judeo-Christian religions that are important. There are. I mean, the Judeo-Christian religion tells us about the one true God. You want to know who God is, who's responsible for creating the universe? This is the only religion that will tell you that. And it tells you how he made it and what he made it for. It tells us about the creation of man and how man sinned and what God has been doing to rescue us from the consequences of our sinful behavior. The, it, it tells us about the glorious future God has for those who embrace uh, Jesus Christ as their Savior. So the Judeo-Christian religion has a lot of things to offer, and it gives us a sense of morality. The Western, Western civilization has a lot of flaws, but at its roots are <coughs> the Judeo-Christian religion, which has served us well. It's one of the reasons that we're more prosperous than any other portion of the world. Now, the secularists won't, don't want to admit that, <laughs> to be sure, but it gives you a sense of more, it's established a sense of morality that has served even a secular God-hating community well. So Judeo-Christian religion has served us well. But having said all of that, the foundation is the shed blood of Christ. The, sa- the foundation of the Judeo-Christian religion is that one day God became a man and, and allowed himself to be sacrificed for the sins of mankind. Had he not done that, all this morality wouldn't do us any good. What good is it? Do you die, you're cast into outer darkness. So at the core of the Judeo-Christian religion is the sacrifice of Christ. Now, the reason for all those animal sacrifices from the time of Adam and Eve up until the time of Christ made his sacrifice, the reason for all those animal sacrifices was to point men toward Christ, to prepare them for the Lord Jesus Christ, so that when he came and offered himself up as a sacrifice, people would say, what's he doing? Now, a lot of folks in the first century that didn't embrace Christ as their Savior, didn't recognize him as the God-man who offered himself as a sacrifice for the sin of mankind. But when Paul went out and preached about Christ being a sacrifice, they understood what he was talking about because they all had sacrifices going everywhere, sacrificing animals or making other sorts of sacrifices was so much a part of the culture that when Jesus came, people grasped it. They may not believe him, but they didn't find it puzzling. Had there been no animal sacrifice the previous 4,000 years, and one day Jesus popped up and says, I'll be a sacrifice for the sins of mankind, people said, what is he talking about? Do you understand? There was a certain preparation. So all these animal sacrifices were pointing men throughout the whole Old Testament era toward the ultimate point of it all. And as we work our way through these animals and the types of sacrifices, you'll find that each of those spoke of Jesus Christ in a different way. And when Abraham was offering sacrifices and Isaac and Jacob, they didn't fully appreciate what they were, what all those sacrifices were pointing to. But they knew if they wanted to approach God, there better be a sacrifice. They knew they were sinners. If they wanted to approach a holy God, there had to be a sacrifice. Again, all pointing toward Christ, which prepared men for the sacrifice of Christ when he finally came. Now, having said that, Satan was up to no good. (laughs) <laughs> You're not surprised about that. And the, what I'm talking about here is what Satan has done is, is offer up a lot of other sacrifices and all those phony religions, which is why it's diminished the understanding of the sacrifice of Christ. Anthropologists, secular anthropologists, look at Judeo-Christian religion and our foundation, which is the atoning death of Jesus Christ, and they say, what's the big deal? All religions of the world have sacrifices. You see what Satan has done? By by incorporating sacrifices in all the religions throughout the world, throughout history, Satan has managed to dilute our message. Secular anthropologists come along and say, we're not surprised that the Judeo-Christian religion points toward a sacrifice of Jesus Christ. All religions have sacrifices. You see what he's done? He's, he's incorporated it in there to dilute our message. And as a result, it has less of an impact than it might otherwise have. The truth of the matter is, what they say is that we, in fact, borrowed the whole idea of sacrifice from all the religions around the world. 
all religions offer sacrifices. We offer sacrifices. It's just we borrowed it from them. But the truth is, they have it backwards. They all borrowed it from the Judeo-Christian religion. When Adam and Eve sinned, God came down and killed an animal so that they could be clothed. It was a picture of how one day the Lord Jesus Christ would be sacrificed so that we could be clothed with his righteousness. Immediately there was a sacrifice that pointed to the resolution of their sin problem. And following that, there were sacrifices throughout the whole Old Testament era. The sacrifices and in, in, in false religions, or those religions that are scattered throughout the world, simply are borrowing from the Judeo-Christian religion. Se- secular anthropologists look at, at the Judeo-Christian religion and, and the foundation of the sacrifice of Christ and the animals that pointed to it, and they say, hey, you know different from all the other religions. They all do that. You just borrowed your ideas of sacrifice from them. In fact, that's just the opposite. They borrowed them from the Judeo-Christian religion, God began his story with mankind after the fall with a sacrifice, and it's been going on ever since. Sacrifices and false religions are, as I just pointed out, satanic imitations. Now, a brief history of sacrifices. When Adam and Eve sinned, the first thing God did after he came down to talk with them was offer up a sacrifice. He killed an animal so that they could be clothed. It pointed to Christ, who would one day again die so that we could be clothed with his righteousness. Wouldn't that be glorious? Would you love to be, I'd love, can you imagine walking the streets of heaven clothed with the righteousness of Christ? Never again a foul thought, a foul word, a foul deed. Perfect. I can only, I just sort of get a little hint of that. Wouldn't that be wonderful? No regrets, because you won't blow it. Maybe some of you don't blow it very often. I sometimes reflect on what I did yesterday and think, oh, Dave, yuck. No more yucks. I like that. No more yucks. So then there was Cain and Abel. They offered sacrifices, but Cain's offering was not acceptable. Abel's was, and there was a problem. Noah. As soon as he got out of the ark, what did he do? He offered sacrifices. Job offered sacrifices for his children regularly. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they built altars and offered sacrifices one into Canaan to the other. Now, when the family ended up down in Egypt, there's no record of sacrifices, though I suspect they offered up some. After the exodus, sacrifices reappeared. And from the time of exodus on, The scriptures are filled with records of sacrifices. But in 70 A.D., this is 35 years, excuse me, after Christ ascended into heaven, the temple in Jerusalem, (coughs) excuse me, was destroyed by the Roman general Titus. The Jews were dispersed. No more sacrifices. The sacrificial system was shut down. But, of course, everything that the whole sacrificial system had pointed to was the the death of Jesus Christ. He came. He died. He was buried. He rose and rose from the grave. He ascended into heaven. And God allowed the whole system to be shut down because it was no longer necessary. Because Christ had come, the fulfillment of all those sacrifices that had been going on for thousands of years. And during the tribulation, the temple is going to be rebuilt and sacrifices will be offered. And then when the Lord Jesus Christ returns to earth at the end of the millennium, and stab- at the end of the tribulation, and stabs this, establishes the millennial reign on earth, there's going to be a millennial temple. And if you want to read about it, go to Ezekiel chapter 40 through 47 or 46, and you'll read all the, uh, an architect's description of the temple that will be built during the millennium and the sacrifices that will be offered there. So the history of sacrifices is an extensive one, all the way from the Garden of Eden through the millennial reign of Christ. Now, some few, a few comments about the purposes of sacrifices. There are non-biblical reasons for sacrifices, and then there are biblical reasons for sacrifices. The, I'm, I'm going to paint a broad picture. Because there are obviously variations on this theme wherever you go. But generally speaking, the non-biblical heretical view of sacrifices out there in the pagan world is they were offered to manipulate God. Most of the sacrifices, if you look at the sacrifices that Canaanites offered up, you look at the, uh, the, the sacrifices 
pagans offer up in all sorts of third world countries throughout ancient history. They were designed to manipulate God. Uh, I need food, then I better offer up a sacrifice. And if I'm really hungry and if things really look bad, I may throw my son or daughter on there. And I'm not exaggerating. They, human sacrifice was very much a part of sacrifices throughout history and in all parts of the world. So generally, they were designed to manipulate God, whereas the biblical view of sacrifices is they were vehicles to worship God. Even though the sacrifices didn't save men, men all men are saved. Old Testament, New Testament, all Old Testament and New Testament, all men are saved based on the shed blood of Christ. Having said that, it was inconceivable that Abraham would come to God in worship without offering a sacrifice. It's inconceivable that Isaac would come to God in worship without offering a sacrifice. We don't have to do it because the ultimate sacrifice has already been placed on Calvary's cross, and he took the wrath for us. So we don't need to come to him with offering sacrifices. But those other sacrifices, we're looking forward to that, even though we're not quite sure what Abraham thought in his mind. He didn't know that one day a God-man, Jesus Christ, would offer himself up as a sacrifice, but he knew that he was a sinner, God was righteous, and that there was a gap between the two, and when he came to God, he better come in with an offering, a sacrifice that was built into the system. So it was a biblical view of sacrifices is that they were, ve they were vehicles for worshiping God. You want to worship the true and living God? Let's talk sacrifice. You sin? Let's talk sacrifice. But it was more than just sin. It was just a vehicle for recognizing that I'm a sinner separated from a righteous God, and if I come to God, there has to be a sacrifice, which is still true today. When we pray, we pray in the name of whom? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the sacrifice God provided for our sins. So we still appeal to a sacrifice. When we come to God, we don't say, hi, God, how are you? I, I, I deliberately spoke that way is because it, that's a, the very idea is repugnant. We come to our Heavenly Father in the name of the sacrifice He provided. When Abraham came to God, he couldn't come to God in the name of that ultimate sacrifice. It hadn't been offered yet. So he laid one out on the altar. You see what I'm talking about here? Sacrifices were critical in men's approach to God. They're still critical in men's approach to God. It's just we don't have to offer our animals because everything they pointed to has already been offered up. The sacrifices are still very much a part of our life. I come to you, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, my Savior, in the name of the sacrifice you provided for my sins. So sacrifices in the Old Testament era were vehicles through which men approached God, just as the sacrifice of Jesus Christ is a vehicle through which we approach Jesus, uh, Heavenly Father, today. In the, but non-biblical sacrifices were quite different. Let's just spend a minute or two on them. Non-biblical reasons for sacrifices. Primarily, they were to get stuff out of God. And sometimes, sadly, Christians use the God that way, and that's not biblical. So I'm just going to talk about how you ought to approach it biblically. But sacrifices in false religions, in, in, in heretical forms of Christianity, were designed to get stuff out of God. I need food? Well, I'll offer up a sacrifice. This presented a real problem for the Israelites who went into the land of Canaan. Because they viewed Jehovah, they were essentially polytheistic. If you read through the Old Testament, you find that the, the Israelites were they 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 believed in Jehovah. They also believed in the others. Jehovah was their personal God, just like the Greeks had their personal gods, and the Canaanites had their personal gods, and the Romans had their personal gods. The Jehovah was their personal God, but he was the God of the desert. When they got into the mountains of Canaan, they said. Uh, we got to grow crops. In the desert, God gave us manna, but now we got to hear, we, we got to grow crops. We need a God of agriculture. And the great God of agriculture was Baal. So they started, they said, we'll worship Jehovah, sure, but we're also going to be worshiping Baal because we need crops. <laughs> it was designed to get stuff out of Baal. We need, we need, we need good weather, and we need him to bless our crops. So they, they, they didn't have necessarily any great love for Baal. Sadly, they didn't have any great love for Jehovah either, but uh, it was designed to get stuff. When you went to war, you offered up sacrifices. Romans were still doing that after the era of Christ. You were going to go to war, offer up some sacrifices. You need to get healthy, offer up some sacrifices. So 
non reasons for sacrifices were primarily to get stuff out of God and also to appease angry and hateful gods. When you look at pagan religions and the sacrifices they offer, you'll find that often it was designed to appease angry gods. Now, there's a certain element of that that's true in Christianity. God hates sin, and to appease his wrath against sin, we offer up sacrifices. In fact, that's what Jesus was. He was a sacrifice that appeased God's wrath against our sin. But notice his, his wrath was against our sin, not necessarily mankind in general. Most pagan gods, if you read uh, compar about comparative religions and about the gods of antiquity, were just mean, nasty critters. They were angry all the time. The idea of a loving, merciful God was not really part of their religious systems. And the idea of that angry, hateful, nasty God becoming a human being and sacrificing himself for us was alien to the thought. I mean, that must have shocked the pagans when Paul started talking about that as he, as he wandered through Asia and Greece and Rome. The pagan gods were usually angry, and unless you, if you want any blessing, you better appease them, which is why the greater the sacrifice, the more likely you would appease your angry gods, and they were polytheistic, most people in antiquity, in the, in, in the biblical eras that are covered by the Old Testament. During those eras, people were polytheistic. They, they, they recognized their gods were hateful and angry, and they needed to be appeased. And the greater the sacrifice, the greater the appeasement, which is why they were so likely to throw their children on the altars because they had to appease those angry, hateful gods. Again, our God is angry at sin, but he's not a hateful, angry God. He's a God of love and mercy and justice. He hates sin. Why does he hate sin? Because sin is the great destroyer of righteousness and peace. Quoting Tozer, you've heard this quote from him many times. Sin is a virus that destroys. God hates sin the way a mother would hate the polio virus that would destroy the life of her child. Should a mother hate the polio virus that's going to destroy the life of her child? Of course. But that's God's attitude towards sin. He hates it, which is why his wrath against sin had to be appeased in the person of Christ. But he is not, by nature, a hateful, nasty God. Pagan gods were that way, and you had to appease them, but God isn't that way. Sacrificing is also often a part of magic, as, as it was is practiced in antiquity, and actually as it's offered, as, as it's practiced today. Sorcerers and wizards often offer up sacrifices so they could get power. You can see this in films. I'm not a big horror film fan, but when I was a kid, I, I would go to them, and 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 they all had the same basic format. Some sorcerer or wizard wants to tap into the power of the gods. So, you know, he gets some frog eyes and blizzard tails and throws them in a pot with some blood and offers up a sacrifice. And then he pulls out a little book with a magical formula, you know, and cites the words, the right words, usually in a language that, that, that no one understands. And boom, <laughs> he's got the power. Well, sacrifices were not just designed to appease wrathful, hateful gods. They were designed. They were also used by sorcerers and wizards to tap into the power of the supernatural. Sadly, some of that stuff has crept into Christianity, but that's a story for another day. So, some non-biblical reasons for sacrifice. Sacrificing is to get stuff from God. Sacrifices to peace, angry and hateful gods. Sacrifices are often part of magic. Sorcerers and wizards use sacrifices to obtain power. Biblical views are quite different. The biblical view of sacrifices is they're used as vehicles to worship God. And as pointed out earlier, sacrifices originated in the mind of God. God determined in the Garden of Eden to sacrifice Jesus. Some say, why sacrifices? We already sort of touched on that. Because animal sacrifices prepared men for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Had God not established this principle of sacrifice for sin, there probably wouldn't be any sacrifices in pagan religions. There'd still probably be pagan religions, but there'd be no sacrifices. The whole idea originated with God. It's been twisted out of shape by Satan to keep Christianity, the Judeo-Christian religion, from seeming unique. 
it was, we just look like all the rest of them. That's what Satan, Satan does a lot of things that are discomforting. First, he just assumes you believe in no God. Be a secularist. But if you insist on believing in a God, he says, I got a whole bunch of them here for you. You like bald-headed, pot belly ones? Hey, I got this Buddha over here. He's pretty nice. You like, uh, you, you, you want multiple gods in reincarnation? Yeah, you know, how about those Hindus? Hindus have so many gods, they can't keep track of them. He's got a whole bunch of different gods for you. A God that will meet whatever desire you might have. And you say, well, no, I sort of like the Judeo-Christian God. Yeah, I sort of hate doing it, but I've got some heretical views of him. See what Satan does? Satan, Satan tries to sort of meet us where we are. And, and, and uh, none of it would work if God, none of these false religions with their sacrifices would work if God hadn't sort of started, started the whole process off in the Garden of Eden. I'm trying to get you to think back to the beginning. Without that, there probably wouldn't be any. Now, what do the sacrifices teach us? They teach us about the, there's a penalty, the penalty for sin is death. The wages of sin is death. We know that. God told Adam and Eve, the day you eat, you will die. They died spiritually. Eventually, they died physically. And had they not resolved their sin problem, which I believe Adam and Eve did in the, in the atoning death of Jesus Christ, they would have died for eternity, which is called the second death. The wages of sin is death. Now, to drive home that point, you sin. Oh, you're convicted. So God says, I want to sacrifice. And what you do is you come to the door of the temple with this little lamb that you like. You were there when it was born. That's the only animal you have to offer up, and you have to cut its throat. That's very convicting, isn't it? And it drives home the point that the wages of sin is death. Sacrifice is taught that in a very powerful way. So we don't do sac animal sacrifices, so it's, it's, it's kind of, it's a little bit of an, almost an abstract idea. It's not totally abstract. We know it took place, but we don't see the animal slain. Back in the 70s, some Jewish group made a, a Jewish Christian group made a short documentary on how Christ is the Lamb of God. And in this film, they actually sacrificed a lamb. I'll never forget the first time I saw it. I've seen uh, a lot of animals and people die in films, but you know it's all fake. This wasn't fake. They actually slit the, and I, I showed that to a number of friends over the first few years as a Christian, and we all had the same reaction. We just, we, 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 we shied away. We just, we, we, it was very hard to look at because it was real. And then he put it on an altar and they burned it up. And all I could think of was, what an incredible lesson that is. When you sin, and that innocent animal has to die because of your sin. It drives home a very powerful point. And so sacrifices drove that point home. We look back to Christ. They, look, they just saw their sin. They saw the animal. It drove home the point that the penalty for sin is death. It also drives home this point. A substitute can die for us. You sin, but who died? That points to the Lord Jesus Christ. I sin, but he is my substitute. So when Paul started talking about Christ being a substitute sacrifice for our sins, I don't have any trouble believing that. The, the Old Testament saints didn't have any trouble believing that because they'd been offering up sacrifices that taught them that. And also, sacrifices also taught them and us there's no approach to holy God without sins being covered. And the only acceptable covering for sin is blood. All right. Let's talk for a few minutes about the animals that were sacrificed in the Judeo the, in Judaism. When we have remember we 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 discussed the first step in the Exodus, which was to come down to Mount Sinai, where God gave them the law, uh, where they made the Mosaic covenant, and where they built the tabernacle. Now he's going to give in the book of Leviticus the Levites, and in particular the priests, instructions about what sort of sacrifices they're to offer. There were essentially four types of animals that they could offer. The ox or bull, the lamb, the goat, and the dove or pigeon. This is all part of essentially the same group. Let's look at these four groups of animals. The ox or bull spoke of Christ as the servant of Jehovah. It's a picture of Christ. You say, come on. 
What does a box have to do with Jesus Christ? Amazingly, a lot. The scriptures tell us that God likes talking about himself as the servant of Jehovah. Isaiah 42, here is my servant talking about Jesus, whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. This is God the Father talking about Jesus Christ. He calls about him, him his servant. And in Isaiah 53, after, after the suffering of his soul, <clears throat> he will see the light of life and be satisfied by his knowledge, my righteous servant. This is the Father talking about Jesus. My righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. So God loves talking about Jesus as a servant. And truth of the matter is, God likes being, dis, let me rephrase that. God likes depicting himself as a servant. We'll talk more about this a little later on when we get to Ezekiel. And we will get to Ezekiel in a little bit. You're saying, you're going awfully slow. But these first few books of the Bible are so foundational. If you get these down, the rest of it's not too hard to understand. If you don't understand this stuff, it's really kind of hard to understand the rest. But anyway, Ezekiel. That's, we're going fast forward to the time of the divided kingdom. He has a vision of God, chapter 1 of Ezekiel. God comes in his vision to Ezekiel, and Ezekiel sees four creatures. Each of the creatures had four faces. Each had the face of a man and an eagle and a lion and an ox. Why did each have the face of an eagle, a man, a lion, and an ox. Think of it as God's coat of arms. You remember coats of arms in antiquity? A family, a prominent uh, a feudal family would have a coat of arms, and on the coat of arms would be images of great moments in their history. Think of those four images, eagle, man, lion, and ox as images of God, God's coat of arms. So here comes God, and those are those images. Eagle. Eagle speaks of his deity. God wants us to know he's God. He's not your drinking buddy. Now, we love him. We can lay our head in his bosom, but he is God. And when he walks into the room, you bow. Someone once said, what would be the difference uh, if you were sitting in a room and Abraham Lincoln walked in or Jesus Christ walked in, what would be the difference in your response? And the answer is, if Abraham Lincoln walked in, we would stand. If Jesus Christ walked in, we would fall on our faces. He's God. Eagle, eagle soar into the heavens where gods dwell. Eagle speaks of his deity. But he's a God who became a man. He didn't just put on the skin of a man. He became a man. He was born of the Virgin Mary and grew to adulthood in Nazareth. So he's God, he's man, but not just any man. He was born from the tribe and the tribe of Judah of the family of David. And the image you there is the lion of the tribe of Judah. So that's the reason for the lion. And he's also on the east side of the tabernacle, although we'll get to that later on. So what, image, what, what, what images do we have thus far on God's coat of arms? We have eagle, because he's God, man, because he became a man. And God wants us all to know that. But not just any man. He became a man the, who was a member of the lion of the tribe of Judah. So he has a, 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 a lion image on there. And what's the fourth one? An ox. You say, wait a minute. We got this lofty stuff going, and now you have this lot ox, because oxes are, uh, were the great beasts of burden. They were the servants in antiquity. They didn't have bulldozers and earth movers. If you had heavy work that needed to be done, you got an ox. Not real pretty, but they were strong. They were servants. It speaks of his servanthood. And what God is trying to say is, by nature, I'm a servant. I don't just act like a servant. I am a servant. So pay attention, all of you arrogant leaders. The creator God of the universe is the ruler of the universe who is by nature a servant. He serves us. That's staggering. Let's fast forward. John's vision of God in heaven during the tribulation, fourth chapter of Revelation. He saw God on his throne. And then he saw these living creatures. And one of them looked like an eagle. Another one looked like a man. Another looked like a lion. And the fourth one looked like an ox. And there's more to that. Other, there are other occasions in the Bible where those images 
gifts, which are part of God's coat of arm, pop up. But enough said about that now. But I just want you to focus on this. The ox spoke of, spoke of God as a servant. He is by nature a servant, and we need to be servants. If you want to lead, that's good, but you better be a servant. Servanthood is esteemed highly by God. So that's the first animal type of animal. The second animal that was often used was a lamb. And this is uh, the, the, the animal that was most often associated with the Lord as a sacrifice. When we think of Christ offering himself up as a sacrifice, we think of a lamb. John the Baptist saw the Lord Jesus Christ. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So this animal is the animal that spoke of him being sacrificed. Isaiah 53, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears was silent, so he did not open his mouth. So the ox or bull spoke of Christ as a servant of Jehovah. The lamb spoke of Christ being a sacrifice. The third animal is a goat. He spoke of him being numbered with sinners. Jesus Christ was numbered by, with sinners. God says this about Jesus Christ in Isaiah 53. Therefore, I, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life into death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. So what has that got to do with a goat? Just this. On the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, two goats were brought to the door of the tabernacle. The priest laid his hand on one, called the scapegoat, and that goat was taken outside the camp and let go. It spe speaks of our sins and, and our sins being cast out of God's presence once a sacrifice has been made for them. The other goat was slain, and its blood was taken inside the Holy of Holies and sprinkled on the Ark of the Covenant. This is the only day the high priest was allowed into the Holy of Holies. In both cases, and, and what the Bible says is that the day that blood was sprinkled on the, uh, the, the, the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant, Israel's sins were covered. So the goat speaks of Christ, our sin bearer. He is our servant. He was a sacrifice, and he's a sin bearer. And then the fourth animal is the dove or the pigeon, and that speaks of poverty. Uh, God didn't ask the poor Israelites to offer up an ox or even a goat or a lamb. Most of them didn't have any money, so they could offer a pigeon or a dove. Each firstborn child had to be redeemed with the sacrifices of the temple. After Jesus was born, Joseph and Mary went to the temple to offer up a sacrifice to redeem their firstborn son because this, God said, the firstborn son belongs to me. In a sense, you offer him up as a sacrifice or a substitute. They didn't have much money, so they offered up a pigeon. It also speaks of, of our Lord mourning over sins. Isaiah said, I cried like a swift or thrush. I mourned like a mourning, mourning, M-O-U-R, dove. Isaiah 59, we growl like bears, we moan mournfully like doves. And as Jesus approached Jerusalem just shortly before his death, he wept over it. So we have these four animals that were offered as sacrifices routinely. The ox of bulls that spoke of Christ, servant of Jehovah. The lamb spoke of Christ as a sacrifice. It's the animal that's most often identified with Christ as a sacrifice. The goat spoke of him being our sin bearer, and the dove or pigeon spoke of his poverty and uh, how he mourned over the sins of Israel. Now, we'll close on this. There was essentially, oh, though, let me just very quickly, all, there was certain characteristic for all of these animals. They had to be without flaws. Why? Because Christ was without flaws. They have to cost something. And David, when he was on the, uh, remember he, toward the end of his life, he called for a, a, a census, and that was against the law, and a great plague broke out, and he had to offer up a sacrifice, and he went to the threshing floor of, of Aruna, and he says, I better offer a sacrifice to stop this plague. And Aruna said, here, I'll just give it to you. I'll give you my oxen, and I'll give you the land. And David said, incidentally, this is where the temple was built eventually, which is a wonderful another story, how it's all connected. But uh, David said, no, I won't offer, make a sacrifice that costs me nothing. Actually, if it costs you nothing, it isn't a sacrifice, is it? When you give money, if I give you money, but I took it from you, it's didn't, I didn't sacrifice anything. <laughs> so a sacrifice has to cost something. 
David said, I'll offer up nothing that costs me nothing. So, and they were given, had to, they must be given according to the way God has prospered us. The Lord talked about, uh, where's the passage here? Oh, the Apostle Paul talking to the church at Corinth now about the collection for God's people. Do what I told the Galatians, Galatian church to do on the first day of every week. Each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income. God doesn't expect us to sacrifice what we can't afford. He isn't asking the poor to make giant sacrifices. On the other hand, if you're rich, you don't talk to me about pigeons. That's kind of the deal. Uh, God prospers us and expects us to sacrifice according to how he has prospered us. Very little conversation from Jesus about giving in the Gospels. So, but except on one occasion when this widow gave a penny. Remember that? Now, a number of things are significant about that. In fact, we could get a bunch of sermons on it, and a lot of preachers have. Mostly we get money out of you, but <laughs> sadly. We, we abuse the Scripture sometimes, and it's appalling. But the major point there was this. God, he was thrilled with her penny. God doesn't need anything, folks. He owns the universe. He doesn't need your money. What he's asking you to do is give according to what you have. Her penny was spectacular, and we're talking about it 2,000 years later. That's all she had. She gave everything. That was impressive to God. And so what we have about these, they had to be flawless. They had to cost something, and they must be given according to the way God has prospered us, and they must be given cheerfully. Some people say, oh, I don't want to give. I, sad, sorry, I'm, that, that's a sad response. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Hebrews 12, 2, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. He was, he's, he, he, when he looked at the cross, he, he was horrified by it. That's the reason he sweated blood in the Garden of Gethsemane. But that's only one side of the coin. Flip the coin over, and he said, I'm going to save you. And I'm going to save you, and that thrills my heart. I'm excited. I'm sweating blood over the horror of it. But he was thrilled. He considered it a joy to be able to go to the cross and save us. Why should we not have that same attitude when we make sacrifices? And that's his point. You ought to be thrilled that God gave you, widow, the might. You ought to be thrilled, rich person, that God gave you that, that chest of gold to give. What a thrill it is to give. That's what giving should be. It should be sacrificial. It should, should be cheerful. So all these sacrifices... Had, they had to be perfect without flaws because Christ is, was flawless. They must cost us something, and they must be given according to the way God has prospered. It's if you're rich, give richly and do so cheerfully. It's an honor to give to the king. Now, those are the animals that were sacrificed, and there were ty five types of sacrifices. I'm going to zing through these. Uh, I sort of hate zinging through them, but then we need to, do, we need to move along. <coughs> A burnt offering, the meal or grain offering, the peace offering, the sin offering, and the trespass or guilt offering. First, let's talk about the burnt offering. The burnt offering speaks of Christ's total commitment. The procedure was this. You came to the gate of the tabernacle, you killed the animal, and you burned it entirely. This was the only animal. Oh, let me rephrase, rephrase that. You could use any one of those animals for a burnt offering. But if it was a burnt offering that you wanted, then it had to be burned entirely. The entire animal was placed on the altar, the brazen altar. Remember the first altar when you come to the tabernacle and burned. And it was the one offering that was most frequently burned in the tabernacle. Every morning and every evening, they put an animal on the altar to be burned entirely. It was slain, put up there entirely. And as a result, there were brain offerings going 24-7. Every morning and every evening, from the time of the evening burnt offering uh, was placed on the altar. Uh, it was probably the vestiges of the morning burnt offering were just dying out. And anyone who came with other offerings, guess where they had what they had to do? Place it on top of the burnt offering, which then made it the foundation of the other offerings. It's a picture of Christ's total commitment. He sacrificed himself totally and completely. He didn't withhold anything. He didn't say, oh, I'm only, only going to die for the sins of this bunch of people over here or that bunch of people over there. 
he paid the whole price. It was a total commitment, total commitment. And that's actually how he wants us to live our lives as Christians. In Romans 12, 1, it's a passage you're all familiar with. Paul wrote this, Therefore I urge you, brethren, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to, to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. I, somehow I memorized it in the King James. Holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable purpose. Most of you know that in the King James. I want you to be living sacrifices. I can tell you the sacrifice he was looking toward, Paul, the burnt offering. I want you to make yourselves living sacrifices. Put, the, put your whole self on the altar. Not only did Christ put his so whole self on the altar, he held back nothing. He expects us now, in light of all that, to put our whole selves on the altar. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies, living sacrifices, burnt offerings, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. That's the burnt offering. Second was the meal or grain offering. This spoke of Christ's perfection. Now, most offerings were animals, but there could be a meal offering. The meal offering was made with flour, had to be fine flour. And to be fine flour, it had to be crushed and sifted 13 times. That really made it fine. And then it was mixed with oil and incense and salt, but no yeast, and baked. The oil speaks of the Holy Spirit. Incense speaks of sweetness. It was a sweet offering. Salt was a preservative. Yeast speaks of the, is, 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 a, is a metaphor for evil in the Scripture. So no yeast. You had fine flour mixed with oil, incense, salt. Then you baked it. You brought it to the tabernacle, and only a portion of it was burned. This is, you got, a, you got a, a, a loaf of bread now with no yeast, so they're usually flat. You put a portion on the altar. The rest of it was given to the priest, and he could eat it. This is one of the ways the priest was supplied with food. But the big thing is, is it spoke of Christ's perfection. Notice, it's fine flour. You had to crush it and sift it 13 times. This speaks of Christ's perfection. Burnt offering speaks of him giving himself totally, laid his total self out on that altar. The, burnt, the meal offering spoke of Christ's perfection, being crushed and sifted 13 times. The third offering was the peace offering. And it speaks of our peace with God. The reason we have peace with God is because of Christ's sacrifice. Sin was a barrier, has always been a barrier between man and God. It's created a hostile relationship between man and God. When Jesus Christ died for our sins, he removed that sin. There was a hostile barrier between us and God and made peace with us. The peace offering speaks of the peace that was established between sinful men and a holy God by the offering of Christ. He became our peace offering. And the sacrifice was made this way. An animal was taken to the gate of the tabernacle, was killed. The fatty portions were burned at the altar. Then a portion was given to the priest, and another portion uh, was to the one making the offering. He got to take it home. And you say, well, actually just a little bit of fat was placed on the altar. The guy, man who brought the peace offering got to eat most of it. It's not only a picture of, of Christ who is our peace with God, but it's a picture of the joy for the believer. Now that uh, Christ has offered himself as, as, as a sacrifice for my sins, that sin has been removed, I'm at peace with God. Hallelujah! That's joy. So God says, come on in, let's have dinner together. See? That's the reason you got to eat most of it yourself. He says, this is great news. we got peace. Let's have a good meal together. One day we're going to have a sitting down with the wedding supper of the Lamb. It's a peace offering. See that? Peace offering. I want you to be happy. So the priest got a portion, you got a portion, and you sit down and think about the peace you have with God and have a wonderful meal. God is about joy. All right, the th fourth, we only have two more, is the sin offering. And this speaks of Christ who became sin for us. The procedure was this way. An animal was taken to the gate of the tabernacle. It was killed. Fatty portions were placed or burned on the altar, and blood was sprinkled on the horns of the altar. The remainder of the animal, which is most of it, was taken outside the camp and burned. What was that all about? God didn't want that sin offering burned inside the camp. He wanted it burned outside. It's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ who became sin for us. And guess what? When he was crucified, he was crucified outside the camp, outside the walls of Jerusalem. Just as that sin offering 
For 1,500 years, they offered up sin offerings this way. Uh, they bring the, offer, the, the animal to the gate of the tabernacle, later on the temple. They would kill the animal, take a portion of the fat, and place it on the brazen altar, and then they would take the carcass outside the camp and burn it, which anticipated the Lord Jesus Christ, who was taken outside the camp and crucified. So we have burnt offering, meal offering, peace offering, sin offering, and the last one, the trespass or guilt offering, which speaks of the debt Christ paid for our sins. The procedure was this. The animal was taken to the gate of the tabernacle. It was killed. Fatty portions were burned on the altar. The remainder was eaten by the priest. Notice through here, the only animal that was burned entirely on the altar was what? Burnt offering. God says, I want you guys to act that way. Now, you're gonna, there's a strong similarity between the sin offering and the trespass offering. And the distinction is this. The sin offering spoke of Christ dying for me, a sinner. I am a sinner. I am innately sinful. He died for me being a sinner. The trespass offering speaks of him dying or paying the debt for the sins I've committed. There are folks in Christendom who are murderers and rapists and thieves and pedophiles and all sorts of horrible things. They're not only sinners, but they've committed acts of sin. And what God is trying to tell us in these two sacrifices is that, is that in the sin offering, he dies for you, a sinner. But in the trespass offering, he's taking the rap for all the horrible things you and I have done. A debt has to be paid. A debt has to be paid. Not only are you a sinner, the sin offering took care of that, but God says, you did a lot of horrible things, but I tell you what, I'm going to take the rap for it. Think about that the next time you sin. It haunts me. I do something really wretched. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not committing murder and rape. Please don't misunderstand. But still, with the, the light God has given all of us, we all live pretty good lives. We do something really wretched, and I think, you know, Christ had to pay for that. That's what the trespass offering is about. He had to pay for that sin and that sin and that sin and that sin and that sin. He dies for you a sinner, sin offering. But he also pays the debt. He pays the debt. All right. Let's close. The animals that were sacrificed, an ox or a bull, spoke of Christ, who is God and a servant by nature. Think. I love this. I know I talk about it probably too much. It's just that we have a world full of arrogant people who think they're here to be served. No. If you want to be a leader or be worth anything in God's kingdom, be a servant. If the creator God of the universe views himself and his coat of arms as a servant, who are you and I to think less? A lamb speaks of him being a sacrifice. A goat is a sin bearer. A dove, a, person, a, a, a pigeon, speaks of his poverty and how he mourned over the sins of Israel. A burnt offering was the offering that was most frequently offered. It speaks of Christ's total commitment. The meal or grain offering that was sifted 13 times speaks of his perfection. The peace offering speaks of Christ who made peace between you and God. And he says, now sit down and enjoy a nice meal. I like that. Sin offering, he became sin for us. Trespass or guilt offering, he paid for all the wretched things we did. They're quite magnificent. You can read more about it in your notes. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we love you. We worship you. We thank you so much for all you've done for us. We deserve nothing good but you've given us only good. We thank you for that. I pray, Lord, that we will live in appreciation of these great sacrifices you made for us every minute of every day. I pray, too, Lord, that we'll take seriously the burnt offering and offer ourselves up completely on the offering and be burned up in service to you as Christ was for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.